Uh, uh, so the mathematical part, I'll just say the statement, and uh, in case anybody planning to fall asleep at the talk, so you know that's uh, the very big. I will say the statement, which is not should not make sense for you right now, but approximately should make sense. So the idea is that if you have a link inside of the R3, I will explain you the way to construct a shift. Uh, well, more generally, complex of shifts uh, on the Hilbert scheme of points on C2, such that if you take a uh, sections, more precisely all of the homologies of the shift of this shift. Uh, so this is um, as beta, then it is an is a not invariant, is an isotopy invariant. So that's basically roughly the result. So and in particular, you know, there is what means the subscript T. T. T, that means you have action of the uh, T is a torus which acts on C2 and that means it acts on the Hilbert scheme and you have uh, action uh, here and you know this space in particular will have action of the torus, it's double graded space. So and uh, I will explain details of this thing during my talk. So um, all right. And you know things like this were conjectured by many people. In particular, there is a work by uh, Shakira Paganagish, and then there is a work by me or me and Shende, me and Shende and Rasmussen and Gorski and Yugut. So many people conjectured it, and now there is a construction. Right. So, and maybe another thing I want to say that uh, for a particular type of knots, like a torus knot. There is very explicit obstacle. Explicit. Explicit obstacle. Or uh, this shift. And I would say, well, you would, you would ask, well, why, how, why would you do this? Thing? So the point is that uh, this construction is somewhat compute uh, so much. It's much better to compute things with this construction than a usual definition of not homology. All right, so let's start from the beginning. So please ask questions. So right now, nothing should be clear for you because it's unclear what is beta, what is n, what's on. Okay, so let me remind it from the very beginning so that there is a theorem of Markov from, I guess, the beginning of the 20th century so that if you look at the Okay. Oh, good. Good. Much better. All right. So the uh, theorem of Markov says that if you take a braid group, should I remind people what is braid group? Everybody knows what is braid group. I'll write it up quickly in a second. So if you take a, a union of the braid groups on n strands, uh, modulus some relation, which I'll write, then you'll get that's equal uh, this set of equivalence classes is a, a set of isotopy classes. Uh, of links in R and S3, right? So the relations are, um, so the first relation is that if you take two braids, you can flip them. So that's the first one. And uh, the second relation is that if you have alpha, um, sigma n plus minus 1 is the same as, I'll draw a picture. So the alpha here belongs to the um, braid n minus 1. So the picture here uh, is like this. So the braid group is generated by uh, uh, the simple crossings. So if this is i strain and this is i plus first strand, and everything else goes like this. This is the generators. And the satisfy relations, as we all know, the braid relation, 
right? So and the Marcus theorem tells you that if I have a braid, which I will put in the box, let's say uh, alpha, so and, and this is braid on n strands, then if I take a closure of braid like this, I'll get uh, what's called closure of the braid. And the point is that this closure, uh, taking closure definitely does not depend on order. If I take uh, two braids next to each other, so, that's, so the first relation tells you that if I have a one braid and another braid, and I'll just write it like this. So you can definitely flip them around. That's the same as, you know, you just move this beta over here. That's the same thing. Right, so that's the first relation. And the second relation is more interesting that is that you, uh, if you have a braid in this notation alpha on the first uh, n minus 1 strands, and you uh, added one more crossing here this, and you took a closure, so, so you, you can take this loop, could be uh, removed, so you can, this is the same as, you know, this connected plus this kind of loop, right, and this you can remove, that's, that's the statement, and basically equivalence classes model of these relations are exactly isotopic. So basically, if you want to construct uh, a not invariant, it's enough to construct uh, some uh, map from this you, from this set of braid groups uh, which respect these relations, right? So, and probably one of the most celebrated uh, the not invariants is it's, it's uh, Jones invariant, and then there is a more general uh, construction uh, which is called Homfly PT invariant which is constructed, for example, using the R matrices from the previous talk. And, uh, and basically, the recent developments were uh, ha, uh, recent developments due, due to Havanov, Havanov and Rosansky and many others were attempts to construct uh, invariance, which would be uh, kind of some kind of invariance which would attach not just a number, but a vector space to the knot. And this vector space is typically called knot homologous. And in particular, there is this uh, knot invariant, which is called havanov rosansky uh, homologies, which I will explain what it is in a second. So, so basically, Havanov and Rosansky uh, define, give a construction of a um, homologies of triply graded homologies. So this is sum over i, j, k um, to the, so basically any, for the, any uh, braid, they construct a uh, triply graded vector space, uh, sometimes people denote it by Havana Frozansky beta, um, such that, uh, such that first, um, Basically, um, so first of all, this uh, space depends only uh, only on the equivalence class equivalence class uh, with respect to this uh, Markov moves. That means it's not invariant. So, and the second. Uh, it is actually it is actually categorification of the whole simple so, so what does it mean? Uh, so the second statement is that uh, if you take a generating function for the um, so the, sorry I just want to keep the first time. For the dimensions of this uh, vector spaces, so then it would be uh, what's called Homfly 
uh, PT invariant of, uh, uh, so sorry, I forgot to write some numbers. So it's uh, Q power J A power K. So that's conf the PT of, of, uh, of the closure, of the closure of L beta, and sometimes people just write P of L beta. So I will not tell you what is a conf the PT invariant. It's basically, I just tell you that, for example, previous talk was about R matrices. And if you take uh, um, the rational R matrix for the SLN group with the fundamental representation, that's the kind of quantum invariant we will get. Okay. So, and uh, another remark I want to make that construction of uh, uh, Havanov and Razansky, there are two flavors. So, Havanov and Razansky use uh, Zergel bimodules. <coughs> Zergel bimodules define it. Zergel bimodules to define it. To define uh, this invariant. And it's, uh, I guess, for physicists, that would be like, a, it would be symplectic side. Some kind of, it's related to constructible shift, it's symplectic side. And in some sense, I think what we do, it's a kind of mirror duel for this. What we do, it's more like coherent side, coherent shift side. All right, so, um, and the point is that this Zergel bimodulus uh, construction is a, uh, computation is very hard. Even if you write a kind of computer program, uh, I, you basically, like all of the computer program which are available, get stuck somewhere around like a eight crossings. So that's, it's very hard to do computations. and. Uh, and this advantage of the theory, which I will discuss, that it's easy to obtain infinitely many examples with exact answer. So it's in some sense our model is more easily computable. Okay. All right. So uh, now um, I have to justify my invitation and talk a little bit about gauge theory. I guess you know Hilbert scheme does it classify as a is it okay as a gauge theory? The gauge, gauge group is U1, but it's, it's something. So, okay, so, I mean, it's possible that a lot of this stuff generalizes to other gauge groups. We didn't try. So, you know, that's other gauge group means, you know, you just go, instead of Hilbert scheme, do stuff with the other quiver, uh, you know, the Kojima varieties. And I think it's, all of this is possible. We just didn't, didn't have time to go there. So maybe that would be a reason to be invited again when we do it for the other groups. Uh, all right, so uh, let me remind the definition. So field N of C2, so as everybody here knows, is a just set of the ideals inside of the, uh, the polynomial rings of two variables such that the quotient is a n-dimensional space. All right, so, and I would need, and we, as, we, as I said before, there is action of the torus, which is C star cross C star uh, on this uh, variety. Um, and let me just specifically say that there is this nice subtorus, which is anti invariant torus. Uh, so basically, this guy acts on x, y by scaling uh, x and y with opposite weights. It's nice because it actually preserves natural symplectic form on, uh, on the Hilbert scheme. So, um, hmm. and maybe I will just introduce some kind of funny notation. So there is a smaller subset here, Hilp C2, uh, which is, um, how to say it, so that Um, Hilbert Chow symmetric and C2 zero. So what does it mean? So first of all, we always have a map from the Hilbert scheme of um, C2 to the symmetric power of uh, C2, which is basically you take an ideal and you send it to the support of the quotient. You take the support quotient of the 
of this thing, right? So in the inside here, you have a sm slightly smaller subset, which consists of subsets uh, with the condition that some of the so let's say if uh, if it consists of uh, n tuples with the condition that some of the coordinates is equal to zero. I'll just do it slightly small, you know, just introduce this smaller subscheme. It's just because uh, somehow we have chosen to work with SLN group. And first of all, I should also say that whatever I'll say is available in archive. There is only one paper with me and Lev so far, and that's the paper which I'm talking about. All right, so. Now. There was, there was a con series of conjectures, and basically, you know, the conjectures. You know, I will not talk about story, the history of the subject, so I will just write a list of names uh, who talked about this thing. So first of all, there is a work by uh, by me, Jay Rasmussen, and Shende. And then there is a work, a generalization of this thing by me and Tia. Yeah. <coughs> Rasmussen and Schende. So then there is uh, uh, also work by Gorski and Wood. Um, and then there is also physics, uh, a physicist also wrote about this thing. There is a, a work by um, uh, Aganagic and Shakirov. So they don't talk about Hilbert scheme, they talk about uh, 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 McDonald polynomials, but you can connect it. So I would say that they also had some, some similar ideas, which state the following conjecture. Uh, so, so before I state the conjecture, I need to uh, one, I need one more piece of notation. So the, uh, there is this universal uh, bundle over the Hilbert scheme. So let's denote it like B prime to be a uh, is a rank n vector bundle bundle on uh, uh, Hilbert. Uh, since I'm talking about this small one, help and C2 uh, such that, you know, if, you, if I take the fiber of this bundle at the ideal i, is just literally this quotient, okay? So this one is rank n, and uh, I want to have a, a slightly smaller one. So basically, you have a quotient of BO. Because, uh, how to say, there is always, here there is always a class of, constant of identity. And this is, this spins, uh, that's, you know, this identity which sits in every fiber gives you a trivial bundle, and I just want to kill it. So this one is a rank one, of this one of rank n minus one. Okay? So now I have all of the notations, and you know, the, I would denote by B check dual, dual vector bundle. So then the conjecture, which I think is false, uh, I will state the right conjecture in a second, is the following. Um, so, again, you know, I will, I'm not giving all of details who proposed which part of the conjecture, but outcome of, if you put all of the things together, the following statement, so that, um, so that there is the shift S beta, uh, let's be generous and say we just, not even a shift, it's a complex of shifts, which is equivariant on the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on C2. So and uh, beta here is the element of the break group on N strands such that, uh, such that, um, if you take a, 
uh, homologies of the um, this shift tensor uh, with exterior powers of this uh, tautological bundle, then this is the same as a uh, havana frazanski homologies of, uh, of the beta. Okay. So here, you know, we have three gradings, right? And here we have three gradings. One comes with the uh, two gradings come from the uh, scaling action of torus T, and another uh, grading comes from the exterior power. This is exactly the three gradings. Okay, so um, so I think this is false. So, but what is true? Uh, so this statement is true, I believe, for the positive knots. If knots are very positive, then it's true. If it's if it's something in between, then there is something more complicated, which I will explain. So, um, all right, so what is this here? Um, it turns out that, first of all, the better object to work with is a flag Hilbert scheme. So there's this, uh, um, let's you know this one, Hilb uh, 1 dot 1 comma n uh, is a, just a set of flags, so it's, I0, I1, IN uh, inside of the CXY such that, you know, the difference, each of them is good dimension one. All right, so. So, so the one of those got three gradings, so one of them was not a cohorty gradient? Uh, one of them is this, right. exterior power, and two more, because we have a torus section, C star cross C star. And what about the three? What that? Uh, well, you know, there is a lot of kind of bullshit going around that is a fourth grading, but I don't believe in that. So you can say, well, there is fourth grading here. I don't think it's an ordinary, but some people say it is, but I don't believe it. So, um, so I think it, it might be a fourth grading if you uh, go to transverse nodes. We have like whole series extends to transverse nodes. It might work for transverse nodes, but I don't believe it's true for the usual ones. All right, more questions? All right, so the, you know, our paper with left is kind of long. It's almost 90 pages. But I think content of the paper could be explained in one page. Uh, so the main reason why it's so long, because we have to work with this uh, object called, like, equivalent matrix factorizations, and uh, the, the subject was not developed. And we have to develop it from the scratch push forward pullbacks, we have to define all of these objects. Uh, but let's go to the uh, statement, which is actually true. Um, so first of all, uh, there would be always the interesting part of this Hilbert scheme is this Lagrangian piece. So which is basically um, pre-image of um, uh, zero times CN. So basically, there's this Hilbert Chow map, and we require that all Y variables of the image are zero. So, and this is like a subspace of a half-dimensional, uh, you know, it's, it's Lagrangian. And actually, all of our shifts will be living on this guy. And, yeah, it's not a coincidence, it's Lagrangian. Um, all right, so what's even more interesting that there is this, uh, the right object is to study so-called free Hilbert scheme. So what is the free Hilbert scheme? Uh, let's just start with Lagrangian parts. So what is the free, free guy? Uh, it sits inside of the, uh, well, let's, let's just save a little bit of chalk and say that for now on, G is a uh, SLN. Gn and uh, uh, group G is a uh, SL. Right. So it sits inside of the. Uh, sorry. It sits inside of the barrel of n times the group Gn times Newton guy, uh, with the condition that if this is x, this is G, this is y. So the condition is that um, this 
x, y, g belongs here. Uh, if and only if, uh, if you take a, a free algebra generated by matrices x and y, uh, applied so there is that there is v vector v such that if you apply this uh, uh, free algebra generated by x and y, you will get whole space v, which is cn. So basically, that's a condition that you have two matrices, both of them upper triangular. So the bn is a, you know, it's it's upper triangular matrices with zeros and n is a strictly upper triangular matrices. So and the condition is that you know you take two matrices of this sort, and you have a vector such that you can generate the whole vector space. It's an open set inside of it, and that's what we call free Hilbert scheme. So the amazing thing about it that uh, uh, that this flat Hilbert scheme, which I just talked here, is extremely singular. But this guy is smooth. So and you can do a lot of geometry. So then you know the our main theorem. So that um, there is a shift in uh, um, object in this periodic category, which I will explain in a second. Uh, so I explained you what is the steel the thing. So I didn't write you what is the actual one. The actual Hilbert scheme. Uh, so this is nested one. Uh, L three. It's just quotient of this big space by the gauge group. Um, by B, by group B. All right, so, and this guy is smooth. Uh, all right, so then the point is that we construct a uh, two periodic complex uh, on this free Hilbert scheme such that. Okay, so since I'm continuing, the two periodic means uh, the periodic derived category. It means we're considering two periodic uh, complexes. So they have like odd and even. Uh, how to say? There would be the shifts of the sort S zero, S one, S zero, S one, S zero, S one. All right. So and uh, the condition is that first of all, the properties that if you take a hypercohomology of this subject of this guy, then it's, it's an isotopy invariant of, you know, of closure. And the second, so we can always, you know, as I said, the uh, elements here is just two periodic complexes. Uh, and you can always take, I know, the, the homologies of this complex. So basically you take, they have you know, the, the condition is that uh, square is equal to zero. So that means you can take odd and even cohomologies. Let's denote it H zero of the complex S and H uh, one of the complex S. And both of them would be actual uh, shifts on the, not, not complex, they would be actual shifts on this free Hilbert scheme. So and, uh, it turns out that actually this, uh, let's denote that this H zero of this, shift of this complex in H1 of S beta are supported on the actual Hilbert scheme, on the Hilb 1N, uh, L, no free, just usual one. So basically, you know, you have the free Hilbert scheme, and obviously the usual Hilbert scheme sits here. So, you know, you, you obviously have the usual Hilbert scheme sitting here just by imposing condition that, you know, matrices X and Y commute. All right, so, and, um, yeah, so anyway, so that's the statement. That's the main statement. So in the easy corollary, you know, which is just statement from homological algebra, you know, you can compute hyper-homologies using, using spectral sequence. You can first compute, you know, these homologies, then you have uh, some kind of differential on this guy, and, uh, the corollary of this statement is that um, so that there are two shifts um, 
S0 beta and S1 beta. Not complexes, but actual ships on the flag Hilbert scheme. So it's flag Hilbert scheme L1n such, um, such that uh, uh, there is a spectral sequence uh, such that uh, there is a spectral sequence um, which converges converges to this hypercohomologies, which is a not invariant hypercohomologies of this exterior power. Um, all right, and what is E two term? So that's kind of important. That's why positive. That now you will see why positive knots are good compared to the other ones. So the E two term of this spectral sequence is the following. Um, E2 term is uh, that if you take usual homologies, it has a differential. E2 term has a differential that if you take S star beta exterior power beta thing, so it decreases the usual degree uh, by one, and it increases the uh, Exterior by z. Okay, right. So that's that's the statement. Now the point is that if you started with if this s beta was very positive, so then you would have only uh, zero global sections, and so there would be this this guy would be only non-zero for k equals zero. That means spectral sequence degenerates in the first term. So when that happens when p is very positive, then that happens. So that then this conjecture, which I was writing before, it holds. So basically, if beta is very positive, then HK, whatever here, is zero if K is not equal to zero. So we get the statement like, like I was writing above. So but if you so write stuff in the middle, if something is, if not is either neither positive nor negative, then it wouldn't be true. So there is no shift. The shift there is nice shift only on the free Hilbert scheme. Any questions? All right. All right. So um, maybe I would say a little bit more about how we construct this thing. Um, okay, I'm going fast. That's I guess it's good. Um, Okay, so maybe I'll say why, uh, why it's interesting, why this theory is interesting. So another theory, another uh, theorem we can show that um, so first of all, there is a special element of the Bradic break group, which is called, I would call it Coxter element. So basically, this is the element where you, um, so how, you how would you draw it? So you have This one, right? So when you kind of twist it a little bit like this, so it, this is this one. And so and it's under crossings everywhere. And in particular, if you take uh, Coxter power n, that would be full twist. That means all of the strands go around and come back, but they kind of made a turn. So and it turns out that uh, this theory is nice in the sense that you know this shift attached to the, uh, and let's call this one twist, TW. So if you take a braid and compose it with full twist, so then it's very easy to see what happens with this uh, uh, shift. This shift get tensor multiplied by the determinant of this bundle, which I wrote in the beginning. So basically it gets twisted by line bundle. So that kind of uh, immediately tells you a lot of answers. For example, if you, uh, uh, for example, we know that if another thing we know that if you take uh, shift attached to the Coxter element, so that would be just uh, um, the structure shift of the um, O of a preimage of uh, zero power n, 
which is called like punctual Hilbert's cube. So and because of that, you know, these two theorems combined, we get the answer, we get right away, so answer for the Coxter element precomposed with the twist any power k, which is also known under the name of torus knot. It's n, uh, it's n1 k n. So, so basically in this case, you know, the, so in this case we know that this shift, we just take this uh, punctual Hilbert scheme and twist it by line bond. So, and that actually was conjectured by all of this, you know, this people that that's what you always forget. All right, so maybe I should say a little bit about the construction. Oh, so yeah, another thing I should say that uh, another theorem which we show that obviously this this thing general like a uh, category is conflictly normal. So also you know that if you um, take the early characteristics with respect to this anti invariant guy, so then this hypercohomology would be only a double graded space. Um, so then it's then it's homely. So basically that provides a categorification of the homely PT. We don't know whether it's the same as Havana Frozansky. That is unclear to us because it's a completely different construction, but we know for sure that it's categorification of homely PT and it's non trivial one. So, okay, so that was the advertisement of the result. Now, how we get there? Any questions at this point? So, and I should say this, you know, this, this kind of, this statement could be generalized, actually. There is more general statement when you take not just full twist, but, you know, there's this uh, uh, L, you know, there is some called the juicy Murphy elements, the ones which you kind of take on the partial break strings and go around. And they also have interpretations twist by line bundles. Basically, the point of this construction is that a lot of natural constructions, like multiplying by natural line bundles, have an interpretation on the node side by kind of transformation of the braid group, so some natural change of the braid group. Yeah. What that? What's one dimensional? T A. T sub A. Oh yeah, it's one dimensional. So you have a one grading here and another grading here. It's two gradings. No, it's two variables. It's one, two. So there is also this plus minus one, which come through. Basically, there is a three gradings. And in general, it would be three gradings. If I would write QT, it would be three gradings. So, but I take, uh, early, like, I take early characteristics of one of the gradings, and I take usual, you know, the grading with respect to anti-invariant one. So in, actually, another interesting thing happens that if uh, uh, node is positive, so that kind of implies that uh, this uh, early characteristic part is always will have the same parity which is not obvious from the just definition of Holmes polynomial. And it might, actually, it might have some kind of physical meaning because, for example, Aganagish and Shakirov, they kind of talk about torus knots and don't say how the construction would extend to the other knots because they have S1 symmetry. And these are the positive knots. And for them, you don't have like this. They are, the Holmes polynomials are positive because all of this uh, extra degree always will have the same parity. So and that's what we observe here too. All right. So the construction. Um, okay. okay, so the here the magic. The method. Um, so we introduced this uh, auxiliary space. Uh, which you already have seen, which is this one. Uh, it's N. And uh, we have a potential, which left call by, for some reason, called super potential. Uh, I think it's just usual potential, but uh, which is this. 
Okay? And uh, the point is that also this object has the actual direction of the uh, two copies of the parallel group. So basically, you have, you have a two guys, two uh, group elements. So then they would act on this element here by conjugation and uh, So that's the action. All right. So, and it's not hard to see that this potential is actually invariant with respect to action of this barrel. Uh, and the, our main object is actually a uh, uh, category of matrix factorizations, which are equivariant with respect to this barrel this two uh, square of barrel. So uh, we introduced this MF square V X R W, which, you know, what it is. So it is just, um, so let's denote uh, this ring of functions on this uh, C on this ring of polynomial functions on this guy by R. Okay. So and then uh, uh, the matrix factorization is actually uh, just tensor product R times V, where V is uh, Z2 graded and differential. So V is Z2 graded. And uh, D is also Z2 graded. So and the condition is that D square is equal to W. So and that, you know, generally this uh, theory of matrix factorization was started by Eisenbahn in the 80s. When he studied like a, well, he studied it just for homological reason. Then later on, Kansevich suggested that matrix factorizations would be relevant for the uh, coherent side of the mirror symmetry. And uh, then our law developed uh, like some kind of derived categorical approach to this uh, matrix factorizations. So it's a long history of the subject. So, but somehow nobody bothered to study this uh, equivalent guys. So, and uh, the one naive definition, is there any questions about it? So basically, it's two periodic complex. So, um, so I didn't tell you anything about equivariant structure. So then, um, the equivariant structure you can say that well, we can just require that uh, D is B square equivariant. Well, it turns out to be a little bit too strong. So that's what we call strong equivariant space. Actually, to make things work, you have to uh, introduce slightly more general theory. So where you require uh, object to be uh, uh, triple. It will be R, D, D as above, and some correction term. And uh, the point about correction term, so what is this D curly? So D curly is... Um, Um, is this map uh, from so it's it acts on this uh, product of uh, um, this. all right so so basically uh, we have to include our uh, uh, barrel more precisely, uh, unipotent part of the barrel into definition. So the problem with uh, like why do we have to do all of these things? Because people studied uh, equivariant matrix factorization with action of the reductive group. So, but in our case, group is not reductive, and we have to be like super careful about it. So basically, we have to define new homological machinery to work with this non-equivariant uh, with, with equivariant matrix factorizations. So, and the condition here. So, so I gave you definition that the condition here that D usual plus this correction term plus this uh, Chevalier 
Ellenberg differential, which would be now acting on the bigger ring. So it's this, this, and times universal enveloping of this guy. So we want this guy square also to be equal to W. So and that is uh, our definition of matrix factorization, which is equivariant. And we also require, and six, we require that it's uh, so everything is T square equivariant. So, so basically, Borel has a reductive part, which is torus. And for with them, you could be like very careless, say, well, everything is equivalent with respect to reductive part. But with a non-reductive part, you have to like deal like this. All right. So and in particular, it's easy to see that you know, there is inclusion. That's, you know, if you have a strong, uh, strong equivalence, you would have big one. Because you can just set d equals 0. Because uh, if we require d to be uh, equivalent, then the, this um, chevalier and bear differential will compute. Everything will be fine. All right, so that's our, uh, that's the most technical part. That's why paper is so long, because we have to work with this more general theory. So now we show that actually this category has a natural convolution, which unfortunately I don't think have time to explain. So basically, we give explicit construction for the convolution. So this mf b square. Has a associative product. Has associative product. Uh, product. So that's uh, quite involved. So then, second, uh, we construct explicit homomorphism from the braid group N. So let's call it star to this matrix vectorization thing. So we construct very explicitly. Um, and uh, right. And then basically how do we, so that means for every um, element of the braid group, we attach, uh, let's say, we construct the matrix factorization of this sort, this, let's call it C, uh, C beta. And, well, since I have very little time, I'll just say how we extracted the knot invariant from this. So, and I should say that these technicalities which I wrote, they're completely unavoidable. So, uh, so you cannot work with this uh, strongly equivalent matrix factorizations. And it's kind of, it's related to the early work of Razan's so some explanation, physical explanations why you need to have this correction. Uh, all right, so how do we extract the knot invariant? So first of all, there is always the shift attached to the identity. So this identity uh, matrix factorization. And then there is a kind of tool. So you can always uh, change the sign of your matrix factorization of potential. All right. So then what we do, we just take uh, our S beta, it's called prime, you take a, uh, um, uh, S beta, like, like this complex, sorry, I, I just confused. It. This is complex. This is complex beta, and you take a tensor product with identity bar. Now, this is uh, an element, because if you take tensor product of matrix factorizations, potentials add. So, and, you know, this guy had potential W, this one has got potential minus W, so this guy is a uh, X matrix factorization with potential zero which is the same as this uh, periodic derived category. So this is dB. Well, everything is equivalent with respect to torus. So that's how we arrive to the periodic complex. So now, uh, I didn't tell you um, how we get to the, uh, this uh, Hilbert scheme thing. So basically now, we have to take this inside of this, um, um, inside of this space, uh, you, you always have embedding of a uh, B barrel times new potent guy. So this is embedding here inside of this space X2. Okay, so in the, inside here you have even this uh, um, uh, 
um, what to say? There is inside here. There is this. Um, what is what is my notation? Let's call it um, the part which is stable part. There's a stable piece. So meaning that uh, we're looking only at the pairs. So uh, stable. So the stable part is uh, if this is x, this is g, and this is y, we require that, again, if we take uh, x, c, generated by this one conjugated by g, y, then it's generated by whole space. So this is an open piece. So now uh, uh, the node invariant is constructed like this. So you just take this uh, two-periodic complex, and you just do pullback, and you're done. That's the construction. So uh, more precisely, you take this pullback, pullback of this S power prime, like this. And you do one more thing. You take a home over the um, this universal enveloping over uh, let me write it again. So that would be the last formula I would write. So like, so take a home over the uh, universal enveloping of the gauge group of the Chevalier complex to this uh, pullback of the from the stable part of a S prime beta, and that is our complex S. So, because, you know, this uh, home is exactly like algebraic version of taking quotient. And, well, of course, I forgot to write the quotient by the laws. That's it. That's our construction. And we show that it's, uh, uh, that if you take, now we show that if you take hyper cohomologies of this guy, and it's important that we have to twist by these things, because uh, it satisfies Markov moves. which is kind of quite elementary, some statements about global sections of line bundles on projective space. So that's, that's where Markov move comes in. And yeah, that's it. So maybe I'll just stop early and let people ask questions. <laughs>